<laughs> All right. Well, if you're joining to not hear about <laughs> virtual backgrounds on a Zoom and you're looking for information on, uh, on, on the mandates, the vaccine mandate, the testing process uh, for healthcare professionals, for people with federal contract work, as well as employers with over 100 employees, as well as if, if you're a smaller business, how this might affect you in the future and how you should be thinking about this, uh, you're in the right place. My name is John. Uh, I'm CEO of ArcPoint Labs. We have Dr. Chris Cherubino on the line. She is with uh, ArcPoint as well, medical director of ArcPoint Labs. And we will have Bill Judge. Uh, we're gonna call him super popular Bill Judge today. He's finishing up another webinar that he has just before this. And so he'll be joining us in a second, raise his hand and, and talk a little bit about his background. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about ArcPoint to begin with. We are a network of 130 locations uh, spanning coast to coast that are independently owned and operated by industry experts. And it's a, it's a big difference for us. And I think that's something that we take a lot of pride in. Our local uh, franchisees study on everything that you're gonna be hearing today. So in your local market, in your local city, you can have somebody come to you, have a conversation, a real human, Dr. Chris. You can actually have a conversation with a real human, maybe even face-to-face, -face, safely uh, masked up if, if required and you can learn from them directly. And so uh, if you have any questions throughout this process, we're going to have a, a Q and A uh, kind of chart, what's it called? A Q and A area where you can ask your questions to us. And then of course, throughout the entire webinar, you can email us at info at arcpointlabs.com. And our team here at the corporate office will connect you directly with your local industry expert. And they'll get you all the answers that you need. All right, the chat now has info at uh, arcpointlabs.com. Once again, put any questions that you have in the Q&A section of the webinar. I think we're estimating, what do you feel like, Dr. Chris? Maybe like 30 minutes of information. Uh, so we'll try to make that as quick and concise as we can. Leave you enough time at the end to get your specific questions uh, answered that you, uh, that you have. I also want to let you know, Dr. Chris and Bill and our entire education team has been putting together a white paper. That white paper includes everything from survey results on how people just like you are reacting and preparing for the webinar or for, for the webinar. Did anybody prepare for this webinar besides you and me? Sorry, that was a, that was a mistake. How, how they are preparing for the mandate, uh, what the current state of the mandate is, whether it's gonna go through, whether it's gonna be delayed and uh, how everybody is generally feeling about this, including some best practices. Uh, so anyway, we'll get that out to you guys if you decide that you want it. Once again, info at arcpointlabs.com. And with that, Dr. Chris, you ready to jump in? Yeah, and I see that Bill has All just right. joined us, so that's good too. Bill, are you there? All right, he's still connecting his phone. So luckily, Dr. Chris, I'm gonna give some real high bullet points on where we stand today, because I'll tell you what, if you watch the news about this, this thing is full of drama. I mean, this is like a soap opera in the making on how this whole thing is gonna go down, right? Yeah, so let me give you a, a couple bullet points in real time off the press, exactly where we stand at this very moment. Um, so historically information, November 5th, OSHA issued the COVID-19 vaccine testing mandate, the ETS, you'll hear us refer to the ETS a lot today, affecting companies with more than 100 workers, if you have federal contracts or if you're in healthcare, all right? As part of that mandate, employers are required to communicate with employees, know their vaccination status, and then provide uh, a testing options to those employees. They don't have to pay for them, but provide testing options to their employees, including the management of all the data that comes with that, the, the testing cadence, the frequency, the employee name, as well as the results of those tests. So that obviously creates a big stir in the industry, right? Um, there's a stay in place though, and it's it's been issued by the Fifth Circuit Court. So uh, there's a lot of different opinions on this Fifth Circuit, Circuit Court, its geography, its political leaning. And so I think people are speculating that maybe this isn't gonna go through and we have no idea if it's gonna go through or not, okay? We are, we are looking at this in real time, just like you are. However, we do have relationships with industry experts as well as 
attorneys. And so far as of today, most attorneys will we'll get opinions from Bill in the future in a couple minutes here on this, but most attorneys are, are feeling like you should continue to prepare for this to happen for two reasons. One, they generally feel, depending on the judges that are selected in the lottery to hear this case, it could continue to go through. And they believe that OSHA will not push back the date of implementation. And so if you wait until this all comes about, January 5th is going to, January 4th is going to come, sorry, January 4th is going to come very, very quickly um, if you delay getting a plan in place. Okay. So why is this important to you? I think the biggest, the biggest thing uh, to some people is that these fines are massive. Mm -hmm. If you don't work in healthcare, uh, then, then this is going to seem crazy. But this is, this is generally how managing HIPAA or health protected information on the patients, how these fines work. It is per instance, it's per day, and it is close to $14,000 each. So the fines are very hefty if you don't follow through with this, if you don't manage it effectively, and if you can't provide OSHA the results that they need, the data that they need within four hours of their request you can start to see fines on a daily basis that are pretty massive. All right, so that's where we are so far. It's in stay, uh, Fifth Circuit Court, judges will be elected, and who knows how this thing is gonna, gonna go down. All right, Dr. Chris, <laughs> let's talk about, uh, which one is for you? Let me, let me find one that's for you real quick because it looks like Bill Judge had to, um, had to go off. All right, what is actually in the OSHA COVID-19 vaccine and testing emergency temporary standard and how might recent challenges impact when it goes into effect? All right, so, so generally speaking, what does this thing say for the vaccine, for the testing, and then what are the, what are the kind of flags leading to how this is gonna work in the future? Yep, absolutely. Um, so it includes several items and they all change the way that workplaces have to treat their employees with regards to vaccination and testing. Um, but the most important points are that it requires employers to keep records on the vaccination status of their employees. And like you said, this is putting employers into a really new arena if they're not already in healthcare, but they have they must do that. And when employ employees are unvaccinated, the employer needs to keep track of the weekly testing of those employees instead and needs to institute a mask policy for those unvaccinated employees whenever they're doing indoor work with other people. And there are a few interesting caveats to these uh, big bullet points, but those are the really major ones. So this testing mandate, right, it's gonna mean that employers are gonna need to come up with some sort of solution. And I think so many COVID tests now, right? There's so many options, there's benefits, there's pros, there's cons for each one of these testing options. Can you run through very briefly what is gonna- The host has stopped it. Hey, Bill. I'm gonna make you a I'm here. I got you, man. All right. I, I can't get my video going, but who cares? Nobody wants to see an old man. Man, Bill, that is not true. All right, Dr. Chris, types of tests that are available. Yeah, so for this mandate, for the ETS, you can use any type of viral test that exists. And so the two most prevalent types um, in our country are antigen tests, and those type of tests look for a marker that's on the outside of the virus, and also PCR tests or molecular tests. And those tests look for some kind of genetic material of the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, so those are the two options. You can use any of those, and actually they don't even speak to if you can do a combination, which you can. Um, the tricky part comes in that they are allowing for use of over-the-counter or non-prescription tests. And that is, of course, attractive to some employers at first glance. But the tough thing is, for a lot of these non-prescription tests, that would mean that an employer would have to organize how to produce a result that is actually written out so they can give it to OSHA if they're asked, and how to actually keep those records and manage the flow of information from the patient who's actually performing the non-prescription test to them and ultimately to the authorities. So I think that's where the really tricky part of the mandate comes in because there's not a lot of information given by the ETS about how to actually do that, just that you need to. Yep. So there's, there's antibody testing, and, and everybody knows antibody testing does not have a role in mm -hmm. this mandate. That's more to, to see if you 
currently uh, are carrying antibodies to the virus. Mm -hmm. So that we, we take that off. Neutralizing antibodies, same thing. Even though it gives you sort of that risk score, it doesn't, it doesn't play a role in this. So it right. comes down to over-the-counter antigen in office uh, antigen at a, at a healthcare facility or PCR. Just to summarize this real quick, PCR is going to be more expensive. It's been the gold standard. It's a reflex test for a positive antigen. Antigen should be conducted under a CLIA waiver facility. And this is an important part. Uh, you could potentially buy the antigen test. However, the, the clinical lab uh, industry has put a status on there where you have to be an approved level of healthcare facility in order to conduct those in-house. And so, so the, the, the antigen tests, even if you can buy them on Amazon or whatever you, you can do, there are limitations to you doing that in your facility. At home tests, good option, least expensive. You have very quick results. It does require a third party uh, review of the front end. And of course, antigen testing in general requires a physician authorization on the front end, as well as a review by a practitioner on the back end. So uh, there you go. Summary of the, the different tests that are available, the value that they have. Uh, Bill, I think sure. uh, the next question is going to come to you, my friend. Alrighty. Let's see what we can so, do. So what is uh, this standard and how are these recent challenges going to affect the way that it goes into effect if it does? Well, that's the question of the day. And that basically uh, uh, right now um, it's in the hands of the, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals which sits in Cincinnati. And I often read in the newspaper that the Cincinnati Court of Appeals is gonna decide, no, it's not the Cincinnati Court of Appeals, that doesn't exist. It's the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. We have uh, 12 circuits in the country. Um, where I'm sitting in Chicago is the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. And that covers the states of Wisconsin, Indiana, and Illinois. So. Uh, the Sixth Circuit, uh, it, it may sit in Indiana, but it, it, is, it is not the Cincinnati Court of Appeals. Now, what happened was the cases, there were over 30 cases filed to prevent the enforcement of this OSHA rule. Um, and essentially, uh, uh, the one that got all of the attention was the, was the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And that's because they stayed the enforcement. They prevented the enforcement uh, of that uh, uh, OSHA rule. Um, and uh, essentially, the, the fact that there were over 30 cases filed, uh, the circuits, uh, uh, there was a lottery held. And so the 12 circuits went into a, a hat or a bin or however they did it. I don't know how exactly they did it. And uh, the number was pulled out of the hat and uh, the sixth circuit won. So even if there was no case filed in the Sixth Circuit, uh, it was uh, the, the circuit chosen to handle all of these 30 plus cases. Um, and it's a matter of expediency. This happens somewhat frequently, um, not unusual. And so the Sixth Circuit, um, which is considered by many to be a somewhat conservative court, is going to be the one that uh, sorts through all of these issues, whether or not the OSHA rule was overbroad, whether or not it failed to consider the distinctions between industries and so on and so forth. Very good. And then the judges, the selection of the judges, isn't there something about the selection of the judges that will hear the case? Well, uh, the, the panel will initially be selected and uh, it can go from the panel it, it basically of uh, three judges to the full court if somebody doesn't like the outcome. Okay, and so it, 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 we're, we're a long way from over here. <laughs> this is just the start of the race and this is a marathon. Um, and so uh, we're going to have a long way to go. And of course, many, many, many people who review this sort of thing believe that it'll end up in the U.S. Supreme Court anyway. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Uh, let's say that this does go into effect. And we'll talk about uh, the survey results that we have on how we're going to be pushing it out to you guys so that you know how your peers are preparing for this as well. But 
But Bill, what are the legal implications for an employer that uh, if this does go into effect, if they don't follow the recommendations? Well, the immediate uh, 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 effect is that if reviewed by OSHA, if OSHA comes knocking on your door, uh, then OSHA can basically issue fines. And these are per day fines. And they have been, um, a year or so ago, Congress authorized OSHA to increase their fine base uh, by, I think it was three times the amount. So you can be fined up to, I believe it's around $2,200 a day for noncompliance. And OSHA's job, let's basically, is to uh, get you into compliance. So the, the fine or the threat of a fine is sort of a nudge <laughs> to get you into compliance. All right, so there's legal implications, but there's also healthcare implications, Dr. Chris, aren't there? Yeah, and I think this kind of goes back to what you were saying before, which is that we're making everyone act like a healthcare facility in terms of collecting and storing patient information. Um, in our white paper, which we've put together, we refer to a set of standards put out by Yale, which are all about how to store medical records. And it does get pretty complex, especially for an industry that's not really used to doing that. It includes things like making sure that medical records are kept out of sight of unauthorized individuals, that they're locked up when no one's actually directly looking at them and that that information is not shared with other employees even accidentally. So that's one of the biggest kind of differences with this and that employers will feel in a medical realm. Very good. There's also some mask requirements that are that mm -hmm. are thrown into the mix here too. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for anyone who is unvaccinated and they're doing the testing protocol, they will have to wear a mask whenever they're doing indoor work with other people. Um, so if they're all alone by themselves in an office, theoretically, they could take down their mask at that point. But anytime that they are in the office with other people, they'll have to be masked. And the ETS is very specific about what they mean by using a face covering. They want it to be um, at least two layers. Um, it goes by the CDC guidelines for what constitutes a good, uh, good fitting mask mask and it has to not have any uh, valves or openings um, and it should be worn tightly over the mouth and nose. Very good and if you if you work remote if you're part of an employee base and you work remote uh, how do you how do you handle that? Yeah, so if you work remote, it's interesting because you still count towards the number of employees who work for the company. Um, but if you are at home, of course, you do whatever you would normally be doing. No need to put a mask on in that scenario. But as soon as you come to the office, like let's say you only come once per month, you still have to submit to your testing requirement if you're unvaccinated and your mask requirement if you're unvaccinated. Um, or if you are a vaccinated person, you'll still have to supply your records whenever you're intending to come to the office. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Bill, let me ask you a question about how we quantify the number of employees. I think, you know, 100 is sort of this magic number. If you're under 100 as of right now, uh, there's, there's not a mandate in place for that level of employee. But, but let's say that you're 99 employees today, okay? Mm -hmm. And then this actually does go into effect January 4th. And on January 5th, you hire your 100th employee. What do you do in that case? or the reverse of that. Let's yeah. say that you have 105 employees on January 4th, February 1, you drop down to 98. How do you need to handle this if, if you drop below that magic number? Sure. Uh, well, the, the date for measuring this is November uh, the, the, the 5th, okay? Because that was the date that the OSHA rule went into effect, the, the ETS went into effect. And I must say that the ETS, people have to understand, and this will be argued in court as well, is that it's a very extraordinary measure uh, for OSHA uh, to issue an ETS like this. Um, as I remember, in their 50-year history of OSHA, there have only been 10 issued. So think about it that way. This is a very mm -hmm. extraordinary uh, uh, measure that OSHA has taken. Um, but in terms of measurement of the number, uh, as of November 4th, if you had 100 employees, you're, you must comply. That's the deal. Now, if you had 95 or 99 employees, like you said, and you go up to 
uh, 102 employees uh, in December, let's say. Then you have to comply with the law. Okay, so if you go 200 or more, then you're, you have to comply. If you have 100 employees or more on November 5th, but you, you drop down to 80 employees uh, January 20th, you still have to comply. Okay, so if you go up to the number you're in, you have to comply. If you go below the number, even though you had 100 on, on, on November 5th, then you still have to comply. All right, so that magic number applies regardless of when you hit it. You have to you have to hit that number, and once you do, you have to comply. So if you're roughly around there, uh, you know, one question that came up through the the Q and A: If you have federal contracts but you're under 100 employees, where do you fall? That falls under a different set of rules. Um, uh, 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 and you still have to comply, but it's, it's not under this OSHA rule. It, it falls under a completely de different set of rules for uh, federal contractors. Just like I think Chris probably mentioned for um, the emergency, the, the ETS or the emergency rules for medical practitioners as well. Those are different sets of rules. Yep, yeah, Bill's exactly right. So in those two scenarios, there's still a vaccine mandate, but there is no testing option in that scenario. So there's no opt out in that place. All right. Uh, so next question that came across to us, what if my company decides to offer the weekly testing option? Is that something that I can do and what are my options? So Dr. Chris, I want you to speak to, once again, the complexity of the different testing types that are available. This is so complicated and it's so confusing. Different values, different downsides to each one of them. So speaks about the complexity of the tests, the different types of tests that are out there. And then Bill, after she, she answers that, what, any, what are any legal issues with, with data storage, document storage, all of that, because now employers are gonna be be saving uh, employee health records of some form that might have extra requirements around them. So Dr. Chris, first, types of tests and the values that they have. Okay, absolutely. Um, so there are different types of tests in this scenario, broadly, are gonna be antigen and molecular tests. Antigen tests are the ones that you think of that are very quick, generally. Usually you can get a result in 15 minutes. Um, molecular tests, we most commonly have PCR, that's the one we use in the US mostly, and those are going to be either processed at a lab, they can be in a little bit quicker format, but it's not something you would do yourself. So to answer that question of can I do this alone as an employer, kind of yes, you could, but there's a lot of complexity because in order to run the majority of those tests, antigen tests, PCRs, you need to have what's called a CLIA certificate of waiver. And so that's a particular kind of certification, um, which is given out to tell the government that you are allowed to run lab tests, that the uh, staff in your location has been trained, that you're going to follow all manufacturer instructions, um, and that you're going to have a suitable place to be a lab. Um, so that's not something that an employer normally will get. It, it doesn't make any sense to actually register yourself as a lab, I would say, in most situations. So your option, if you're going to go it alone, would be to use over-the-counter non-prescription antigen tests, of which there are a few. But the reason I caution people against that is that most of these over-the-counter tests do not produce any kind of actual result at the end, which is, has been looked at by any kind of provider because they're non-prescription, or which even states basic information about the patient, the time of the test, and their result. So if you were going to do this on your own, you would have to develop a system where you produce a result for each of those tests and where then you get them from the employee and keep them somewhere. Adding complexity to this, a test can't be both self-administered and um, self-reported. So if you were going to do this alone, you would have to designate someone in your staff and train them to be the observer for these tests to be collected and then read out, one or the other at least. So 
that's why it gets really complicated and why I think ArcPoint is a huge help because we are CLIA certified laboratories and we can perform any of the types of tests which do produce a result report and which are looked at by a provider and which are by prescription. And we can do that in such a way that we'll be able to keep and house all of the records for you in the event of an audit. Perfect. So complicated, lots of options. Uh, great summary. Bill, help with the legal side of this document storage, the risk that an employer might take on by doing this testing in-house. Yeah, boy, I'd like some help myself. Uh, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is very complicated, uh, uh, new, very complicated stuff. Um, now, can they be sued? Well, this is America. You can be sued for anything. Um, and as a lawyer, I'm very happy that's the case. Uh, but it, it, I will tell you, seriously, um, a lawsuit can be filed uh, basically claiming that uh, you're violating my rights under the ADA or some state uh, or local uh, disability discrimination law. And uh, the question, it, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act is enforced by the EEOC, okay? The EEOC puts out guidance, frequently puts out guidance. I think I'm looking right now at about the um, sixth or seventh update mm -hmm. that they put out since COVID uh, became an issue in the workplace. And they specifically have added sections related to vaccinations and vaccines, okay? And the question was raised that, uh, can employers require a vaccine? Um, and the answer is yes, uh, you can. And if an employee is raising an objection to that, they essentially can raise an objection based on a disability or a sincerely held religious position, religious mm -hmm. belief. Now, there are all sorts of rules uh, and, and examples of how one demonstrates a disability, how one demonstrates a sincerely held religious belief. But let's say that the employee actually shows that they have a disability or a sincerely held religious belief that should entitle them to be excluded from those being required to get a vaccine. Uh, the employer can come back then and say, well, wait a second. Okay, you're disabled. You have a sincerely held religious belief, but that doesn't necessarily mean you get to work here because mm -hmm. you cannot perform safely. You cannot perform the essential functions of the job, okay? And in order to determine that, whether or not you can perform the uh, essential functions of the job safely, we may call upon somebody like Dr. Chris to uh, help describe why that person um, cannot perform without uh, proof that they've been vaccinated or without proof of a test weekly. You know, there's options here. You don't have to do the, the vaccine if you opt out for the, the uh, uh, the testing and the mask routine. So, like I said, it's incredibly complicated and we're just getting started. Yeah, I, I was going to say that there, there um, if it goes through, there are going to be adjustments and, and pivots that are going to need to be made uh, in order to make sure that you're complying and to the point that you made earlier, uh, there's a lot of fines associated with this, so they're not exactly making, uh, nobody's making this easy on employers right now to navigate this. I, you know, there is a chat in the chat window asking how will ArcPoint um, help employers test? And I think this is, this is driving the point home that there's lots of options. We can, we can help you determine which tests are, are, are the right tests for your specific needs. Mm -hmm. And then there's a follow-up question inside uh, will ArcPoint do the tests only in their labs or will they come on site? Location by location specific, but overwhelmingly, most of the ArcPoint labs locations in the 130 markets that we serve will come on site and do this at a weekly cadence uh, so that it's, it's less of a distraction to your employee base. They will manage the database for you. And, and several of our locations are also able to provide the vaccine if an employee decides that, listen, enough with this testing stuff, I'm just going to get the vaccine. So 
yeah, anyway, uh, we can provide those solutions. And if nothing else, we can just answer your questions. Reach out to us, uh, info at arcpointlabs.com, and we can answer any questions that you have and put you in touch with a local industry expert that can serve you well. All right, uh, so this is gonna be for both of you. ETS indicates employers must treat all records as medical records. What does that mean, Dr. Chris? Yeah, so this goes back to that list of kind of guidelines from Yale, but the idea is if they're medical records, then they have to be kept in a completely secure way where no one who's unauthorized to see that information about that other human being will accidentally run into it. So this means keeping them in a locked cabinet, inside of a locked room, where no one else can see them through a window, and separately from other employees. So it really turns your workplace into the back office of a healthcare clinic. Very good. Uh, it, and uh, under the EEOC's guidelines, uh, there are very specific rules about how you treat this information. Um, mm -hmm. And it's got to be treated confidentially, just like any medical record. All right. Makes sense. So uh, do you have any insights regarding how companies are preparing to meet the ETS? Dr. Chris, let's start with you. Yeah, absolutely. So the big survey that we sent out to lots of different employers, many of whom have more than 100 employees, so this will affect them, um, showed some really interesting things. So first of all, the overwhelming feeling from employers is unfortunately anxiety because they know they're going to have to change the way that they do things on a relatively fundamental level. Um, and they're starting from a place where they don't actually know that much about what's going on with their employees. So of the locations that we, the employers that we talked to, um, only less than two thirds actually knew the vaccination status of their employees at the time of asking. So the first step for all of them is that they're going to have to do a huge survey of information to even have a starting point to know how many employees need to be vaccinated, how many need to be tested. So that was pretty interesting. So Dr. Um, Chris, real quick on that point, if you're yeah. going to be collecting vaccination records on your employees, what exactly do you need to get? Is it just Yep, I've done it, a survey, they check the box yes, and you take the word for it, or what do they have to do? Yeah, so they have a few different options for how they can actually collect that. They can have a CDC vaccine card, that's one of the best ways, an attestation from the patient, which would have to be like notarized, um, if they don't have access to that vaccine card for some reason, um, a record or letter from a medical provider or from a public health agency saying they have been vaccinated. Those are the three big options. And they have to store that data as part of the collection process as well, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, the only kind of interesting caveat there is that if an employer has already collected this information before the ETS goes into effect, they don't have to redo it, but they do have to make sure they have at least that minimum standard of proof. Um, yep, so that's the first piece. Um, in terms of the numbers, of the employers who did know the vaccination status of their employees, um, a pretty wide range across the country of amounts of vaccination. So of the ones we surveyed, it could be as little as 26% of the employees who were vaccinated or as high as around 75%. So depending on where you fall in that number line, you're going to have either a lot more work to do, especially if, the, if you're a 26 percenter and those people don't want to be vaccinated. It's going to be a lot of testing every week, or it could be a relatively small amount. And we found geographically that it kind of follows what we're seeing in the country. If you go to the CDC COVID data tracker, which is like a place I go every day, it looks kind of the same. So the people on the coasts tend to be a little bit more vaccinated, middle of the country, a little bit less in general. And that's what we saw in our survey data also. Yeah, and the, the uh, Association of General Contractors, we, uh, we partner with them. They had a webinar last week uh, and they stated roughly 30% general contractor employees uh, are unvaccinated. And so if that's a good benchmark, 23,000 uh, different businesses, that's a, that's a good benchmark. All right, Bill, anything you want to add to this? Yeah, I, I'm surprised at that number. I, I would have expected it to be a bit higher. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the key things that uh, needs to happen and employers have to get busy if they haven't started already is putting a policy in place. Um, you have to have a vaccination policy in place. And that's one of those things that uh, when OSHA knocks on the door, they're going to ask for. And so, I mean, as, as, as much as employers would rather not deal with this issue, and I understand it completely, you still need to put a policy together. 
um, and be ready for uh, uh, issues like how to who's got to be tested, uh, you know, uh, how often they're going to be tested, what choices employees have, you know, how you're going to accommodate all of these various issues that uh, employers just uh, don't want to deal with, but you, you got to get busy and do it. Uh, if you have a policy, you should dust it off and update it according to the new uh, OSHA mandate, um, yeah, OSHA rules, and go from there. Uh, but uh, please start addressing that policy issue now. Yep, and, and I'll tell you, you can either go directly to the OSHA website and navigate the deep, deep ocean of that website uh, and find the documents that you need, or uh, you can reach out to one of the local arc points in your market, and we have that stuff at the tip of our fingers. We can yep. send it over to you and help you navigate that as well. So yeah. that's a really good point, Bill, the, the policy that's it's, that's going to be a part of that. Yeah, the OSHA rules are only about 500 pages long, so I, I'd rather call arc point. Man, it's <laughs> a page turner. I'll tell you what, we read that yeah, thing cover to cover. <laughs> page turn. <laughs> that, that statement has never been stated before. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so, so this is more of maybe a philosophical question. Uh, and this actually came up in a, a group discussion that I was in on Tuesday. And that's how should we handle the, the communication with employees? You know, I think there's, there's some companies that, that don't want to uh, don't want to turn over the apple cart, if you will, by scaring employees, you know, forcing them to answer questions that they're not ready to answer yet, or, or maybe, you know, going down a path that they should be going down early. They know that they should plan, but there's a whole kind of internal political capital kind of kind of relationship thing with the employees that they're, that they're scared of. Just, are we seeing any indications? Are we hearing any feedback from employers on how they're navigating that? Well, in the survey results, one of the things that we heard pretty resoundingly is that people are worried about implementing policies um, for that exact reason, alienating their employees, but also losing their employees in general if they implement a policy. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely a concern. Um, yeah, what do you think about that, Bill? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, whether we're talking about uh, uh, this issue or drug testing or any other issue, employers are scared to death to lose employees because they can't mm -hmm. find any. Yeah. Um, and, and every single employer has to deal with these issues um, for their own, not not just corporate philosophy, but their own locations um, and, and how things should be communicated, uh, how they normally communicate things um, and uh, make certain that their employees are aware that this is a government mandate. OK, this is not something that corporate just dreamed up and we're going to impose it on you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're doing this because OSHA requires it. Now, let, let's also back up for a second and, and say, uh, from a philosophical perspective, this is not unusual for a lot of employers to deal with OSHA. Uh, there are a lot of industries where OSHA uh, requires uh, uh, masks for different sorts of, of, of uh, duties that are performed. Um, OSHA requires all sorts of training. Um, so dealing with OSHA and OSHA mandates is, in, at least in my experience, 40 years of being a lawyer is not necessarily an unusual thing. No one, it's kind of like 60 minutes. You don't want them knocking on your door um, because that never means anything good. Mm. <laughs> so, but uh, at the same time, compliance um, with OSHA standards uh, is like any other compliance issue, um, kind of a pain in the butt, but you got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and their demands are relatively high. They come in and they request your records. You have to turn those over within four hours, I think is the guideline. Yes, that's that, right. That right. Yeah. So, so yeah, you have to make sure that all of your information is easily accessible, easy to pull and that you can distribute it in, a, in an effective manner to keep that data secure. Um, so somebody asked a question, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go to the chat window for a minute. We are, uh, yeah, we're, we're down to the last 22 minutes. Looks like we have a lot of, of chat questions. So let's go there. What's the vaccine mandate for small businesses of under 20 employees? And Bill, just correct me if I'm wrong, there is no mandate if you have under 20 employees unless you have federal contracts yeah. unless you serve the federal government 
That's right. And those, and those, as I mentioned before, fall under a completely different set of rules, which I'm more than happy to share with everybody uh, in terms of what those uh, statutes or uh, regulatory requirements are. Um, uh, there are differences for uh, uh, healthcare settings, differences for federal contract and subcontractors. They fall under the Federal Workforce Task Force COVID-19 <laughs> Workplace Safety Guidelines. I almost couldn't get that all out. Um, so, um, but remember, uh, the questioner asks for under 20 employees. You're not in this mix. It only applies to those with 100 employees or more or acquire 100 employees after the deadline, which was November the 5th. Perfect. Uh, it does apply to healthcare businesses as well. And there's some rules around how a, how a business is defined as a healthcare provider. Right. There's, uh, a, there's a healthcare ETS that was issued earlier, um, June 17th, to be exact, uh, yeah. of this year. Yeah. Very good. All right. So uh, somebody's a small business, federal contractor, if someone gets a medical or religious exemption, can they still perform work on that contract in the office or is being off work the only option for those people since testing is not an option? Did you get that? Not quite sure I understand, but uh, those who are working from home are not uh, under this rule uh, unless or until they go into the office. So if you, if you have, I think the question is this, if you're a small business under a hundred, but you have federal contracts and you have an employee that will not get a vaccine uh, because of religious exemptions oh. or medical exemptions, or maybe they, they choose not to get the vaccine. Yeah. What do you have to do with that employee? Can they not work on the project? Well, I can just say choosing not to get it just because you don't want to get it, that's not an option. Uh, the only two exemptions actually fall under the religious exemption or the disability dis discrimination exemption, uh, of proof that you have a disability. Um, and there are a lot of steps to going into proving both of those. Uh, it's just not an automatic thing to say my religion precludes me from getting a vaccine. You know, there are a lot of issues that have to be discussed before that is just automatically uh, uh, goes into effect. Uh, and, and EEOC has guidance on all of this that, you, that can be accessed. Um, and a lot of this has to do with, okay, sincerely held belief. Well, okay, mm -hmm. do I believe you? Are you credible in, in terms of that? Uh, whether the employee has acted in a manner you know, consistent with that belief in the past, um, whether the uh, accommodation that the employee seeks um, is a particularly desirable benefit and whether the timing of the request renders it suspect. <laughs> so yeah. now clearly these are all subjective analysis that have to go into effect, go into play, but uh, it's just not walking in the door one day and saying, hi, my religion precludes me from um, getting this vaccine. And it certainly is not those folks who just simply say, I don't believe in it or I don't want it or whatever. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Uh, next question in the Q&A section. How will employers keep track of the weekly tests for all of the employees uh, I assume all the employees that need it. I'll speak on that in a second. Mm -hmm. Is there a form of software for this? So I think the first section is uh, testing is only mandated for the unvaccinated. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, and it's a weekly testing requirement. And otherwise, uh, while uh, in the workplace, as Dr. Chris mentioned, mentioned earlier, uh, you got to wear a mask. Perfect. And, and a roster can be can be maintained. Now, let me say something uh, before those of you who are more familiar with the keeping track of records, because if you saw my office, you'd know I don't. Um, the, that, that record that's maintained has got to be maintained confidentially. Please make sure of it. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so the, the follow-up question to that, I think, uh, I don't see the question anymore. The follow-up question to that was, here, I can go to and go to the answered. 
um, well, it was something to do with what types of systems are out there, what types of programs are available. And, and Bill covered it um, real specifically. There is a, a high need for security in this database, both with the vaccine record collection that you're doing, as well as the maintenance and the ongoing record keeping of the testing. And, and if you get requests from OSHA, you have to be able to turn those results around very, very quickly. That's right. So security is key. And, and just know that your local industry expert uh, in your market with ArcPoint Labs, we have a software program that will allow us to uh, uh, help you collect the vaccine information. And it allows us to maintain all the health records for both the vaccines as well as your testing results. And we assist you in providing those in a format consistent with how OSHA will be requiring them if they do come knocking and they need that information. So uh, you can turn to us, info at arcpointlabs.com, and we would be more than help, happy to, to help you meet the technology and software requirements for this mandate. All right. Uh, what if you have an employee who is vaccinated in March, but now refuses to take a booster? Dr. Chris, what's, yeah. your, what's your thoughts on this? This is a really interesting one. And a lot of people have asked this question. So I'm glad that you brought it up. For the ETS, we're not considering that boosters play into it. And that is actually in line with the CDC and FDA guidance right now. Although they are available to people who were vaccinated over six months ago, they're not considered required. And after two doses of a two dose system or one dose of Johnson & Johnson, you are still considered fully vaccinated whether or not you get a booster. So if a person doesn't wanna have a booster at this stage, it does not affect their standing in the ETS. Perfect. Uh, let's see, are there any opt-outs under the federal mandate? So the federal side of this uh, says federal money, federal contracts. Can you, can you uh, have religious or medical exemptions if you have federal contracts? Yes, those, those two options still exist, but you've got to demonstrate uh, the, your sin, religious sincerity and you've got to demonstrate that in fact you are disabled. And that's it, those are the only two. All right, very good. What is your interpretation of exception to the testing requirements for employees that are exclusively outdoors outside? Yeah, this, I was reading through the, the, yeah. the FAQs on the OSHA website, because, you know, it's, once again, a page turner. And this was, this was a very complicated part of this. So uh, Amanda, I think Bill might be best. Uh, yeah, I, I, in, in what the commentary so far on this uh, has basically talked about the fact that if you are outdoors and you, come, you, you perform your tasks while outdoors, then you need not uh, demonstrate your in compliance with this. The problem, obviously, is uh, if you're going to then go indoors at any time through the process, as a practical matter, you're going to have to be one of those who can demonstrate vaccination or choose to get the weekly test and masking. That's, yeah. that, at least that's how I see it, Chris. What, what? Yeah, and I was just gonna add that this is actually in line with the CDC guidance about when people should wear masks um, and outside has really proven to not be a place where a lot of transmission occurs. So I think that's probably why it was written this way. It is in line with the other federal agencies and what they recommend. Gotcha. And then I think generally we can speak uh, the next follow up question that what types of operations do you think are intended to be covered by this uh, by this exception. Um, you know, I, I think they're trying to be as black and white as they can, recognizing that not everybody fits into a very, very specific box. Mm -hmm. So I think generally they're trying to provide the, the flexibility if you do have people that don't fall into uh, what they're considering to be high risk activities or high risk environments. Uh, if you end up in a high risk environment, they're trying to make sure that you're, you're covered, keeping people safe. So, um, so Rob is asking, can we require employees to show up each Monday morning with a negative test result from a qualified facility if they do not provide a negative result, uh, send them home until they do? Well, I would say that under, we don't know the answer to that yet. I don't at least, uh, but I can say that under previous federal guidance from the EEOC, the answer would be yes. Um, because that this raises a, a, uh, 
you know, a, a potential for harm uh, mm -hmm. or infection in the, in, you know, spreading of the infection. And this qualifies for employers, at least under previous EEOC guidance to mandate that, yes, you be vaccinated or be tested uh, every Monday uh, with masking if you choose not to, to be vaccinated. And uh, uh, in the absence of those two qualifications being met, the employer has the right to send you home. And if the ETS goes into effect, Bill, then certainly that would be the case, correct? Correct. Yeah. And then I believe, uh, you know, we, we, we speak to a ton of employers about this. We're answering questions every day. Uh, one of the recommendations that we provide is, is conduct your testing through a third party on site. And so find a, find a, a laboratory partner, a, a testing partner, they can come to your facility and conduct the testing on site on your behalf. So you don't have to worry about the requirements of doing it right, making sure that you have the right certifications and the right requirements uh, to be able to, to, to run these types of tests. They'll also make sure that the data is collected and then it's just a convenience for employees. Employees don't have to show up over the weekend at some laboratory, they don't have to wait in line at a, at a laboratory. Uh, they can just come into work on a Monday morning, get their tests conducted, and then get their results text back to them. That's the value of rapid testing, by the way, being able to provide that instant result to them uh, so that they can just come into work, you know, sit in their car while they're waiting on the results, get a text message back to them with their results, and have that to come in and, and walk through the door on Monday morning ready for work. So uh, just some recommendations that that have been provided through our point to our uh, employers, customer bases, and they answer the question. Yeah, and I just want to say one other quick thing about that. Another really cool thing about partnering with ArcPoint for this is that depending what your industry is, you may be dealing with unions who have their own rules for what types of tests you can run. Um, we've seen that a lot in production companies. Um, their union, for example, really wants only molecular tests. But that's a thing that as um, an employer, if you're just working with them, you might not actually know about. But something that ArcPoint can help you put together testing protocols that fit that specialized rule. Very good. Okay. Uh, Kelly asked a question. If a company requires the vaccine and an employee has a severe reaction, can the company be held responsible? Bill, what a <laughs> landmine of a question <laughs> this is. We've done enough of these to know that, uh, yeah, man, take a shot yeah. at that. Yeah, well, maybe I'd sue the uh, person doing the testing. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, you know, can the employer be held accountable for that? Um, there are court cases that have been decided in, in other uh, areas uh, similar to this where the employer is not held liable um, if this has been outsourced to professional outside parties. So, uh, you know, can the employer be held accountable? It depends on all of the issues related to how the employer uh, set up and, and ordered the, you know, the, the, the testing and who they hired to do the testing, you know, all that sort of thing. But can they be, if the person gets sick uh, or has a reaction, um, there are so many factors that would go into play in the, in the answer mm -hmm. to that question. Like, you know, the, did the individual disclose previous reactions to vaccines? Did they, uh, you know, disclose uh, uh, previous reactions to the types of vaccine provided? And, you know, Dr. Chris knows all of the issues that are pre are usually asked in terms of uh, vaccines in order to, before you're tested and so forth. So there are a lot of issues there. Will the employer be sued along with the, the, the third party providers that actually initially vaccinated the person? Most likely. Yeah, it, it, is a, it is a complicated situation. And I think the general summary of that is there is previous case law that says that it, it potentially will happen. And once case law in these specific situations arise, then that will be the indication on what direction that'll go. But um, yeah, just lots of complexities inside of that um, and sort of, sort of got to just wait and see. Uh, is the nasal swab the only way to test? Uh, small assisted living community, what's the cost of testing? So 
So the cost of testing, let me cover that real quick. Cost of testing is going to vary by location. Uh, different markets have different pricing. And you can find uh, pricing at, on home kits, pricing on antigen testing, and pricing on PCR testing by emailing us at info at arcpointlabs.com. We'll be more than happy to get you in touch with somebody local, and they'll be able to talk through the pricing of testing with you, as well as help you align your specific needs with the best test for your needs. Uh, yeah, same question. How much will ArcPoint charge employers for weekly testing of their unvaccinated employees? Uh, we, uh, we will make sure that uh, we get you in touch with a local industry expert so that they can, um, yeah, so that they can cover that need for you. And saliva is an option in addition to a nasal swab. Yeah. What constitutes a company as a federal contractor? Well, frankly, that's under different rules, and uh, I am—I don't know the answer to that. It's not an area that I typically uh, am involved in. Yep. Our interpretation is that uh, somebody that has a federal contract or uh, somebody that works on, on federal projects is falling under that federal contract. Right. Now, one thing I do know, and we run into it all the time with drug testing, the uh, individuals that are operating for the company under that federal contractor are, contract are the only ones governed by that federal contract. What does that mean? Uh, if you're a multi-state employer uh, and you're in all 50 states, for instance, or you're a federal contractor and you've got employees all over the country, if you've got 100,000 employees, but 20 of them are actually functioning under that federal contract, those 20 employees are the ones that uh, uh, are restricted under the contract, not the whole company. Now, gotcha. I would have to look into the, uh, the rules related to federal contractors uh, under the COVID uh, ETS in order to tell uh, whether or not that's a different uh, set of rules. And I'm sorry, right. if they had answer, we can get it for you and more than happy to uh, send it out to you. Yeah, perfect, Bill, appreciate that. And just to clarify the, the AGC survey, uh, yes, 70% of the workforce is vaccinated. Maybe I said that backwards, I no, apologize. That, no, you just, did, you said it right. <laughs> okay. okay, good, well, clarity, 70% have been vaccinated, so there you go. Uh, let's see. Can employers grant a religious exemption without getting further documentation from the employee other than the, just the employee requesting the exemption? How does that work, Bill? Well, again, as I said, the documentation is not something that I think plays into the religious exemption uh, because it's a sincerely held religious belief. OK, so how do you demonstrate that according to guidance that's been put out? Um, it's uh, essentially while an employee's religious belief may be sincere um, to qualify for an accommodation, the guidance that's been put out essentially says you've got to measure the credibility of that individual. And uh, the guidance uh, uh, lists several factors that might undermine the employee's credibility, including whether the employee has acted in that in a manner consistent with that stated belief. In other words, you, you, do, you go to, do you go to services every Sunday? Uh, do you go to services Wednesday nights? You know, that sort of thing. Whether the employee has acted in a manner inconsistent with the stated, stated belief, that's an interesting one. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether the accommodation sought in per, is a particularly desirable benefit and whether the timing uh, of the request renders it suspect. Okay, so. Uh, you're claiming a religious belief, you're, you're claiming to be a Christian, and that your uh, belief uh, prevents you from uh, getting the vaccination. Okay, if you've never gone to services, that doesn't mean you're not necessarily a sincerely held religious belief, um, but uh, there's got to be some evidence of the fact that you have in the past held that belief and acted upon it. If, if that is an appropriate way to put it. Perfect. All right, so we're down to the last two minutes and this is actually, uh, Kelly has asked a question. This is one of the most popular questions that we get as well. 
and that's regarding medical insurance. So uh, a little bit of history on how medical insurance works. I'll let uh, Bill and Dr. Chris kind of kind of clean it up. In order to have something covered by medical insurance, it needs to have uh, a diagnosis purpose and it needs to be considered medically necessary. Okay, so testing has has typically been ordered by a practitioner. That practitioner has to uh, assume that there's a medical necessity, uh, create that medical necessity, and then create a diagnosis associated with that for insurance to pay. Okay, so all this means there's a lot of paperwork, there's a, there's a doctor involved, all of that. And, and yes, there have been cases where things that aren't medically required have been covered by insurance, things like travel testing. Uh, now, here's what we're hearing from insurance providers and Kelly and anybody else that has this question, here's what I'm gonna recommend. Go talk to your insurance provider that you have for your employees to determine how they're gonna be viewing this. And, and here's why. We've started to see situations where medical insurance is denying the claim and then going after the patient for those monies. And so what means it might seem free when the test is conducted, but the insurance company has the ability to do a couple things. Uh, they can either perform clawbacks, which means that they're gonna go after it and you know, do an audit, request additional information on the medical necessity and, and determine that it wasn't medically necessary and then ask for that money back. They also tend to frown on reoccurring regular testing as well. Uh, now we can say that OSHA has been very, very silent on how uh, insurance plays into this game. In fact, they mention nothing about insurance. However, they do talk about employers can cover the cost on behalf of employees uh, but they don't need to. They can, they can force the employees to pay for this test themselves. And in those statements and the frequently asked questions, there is no information on insurance. So my best recommendation to you is reach out to your local insurance provider and ask them how they're viewing this mandate and whether or not they're going to cover the cost of the test. Anybody want to add anything to that? Yeah, just one thing. I think one of the things to keep in mind about insurance is that they prefer to pay for a less expensive um, thing for the same condition. So in this case, recurring testing that's every single week is going to ultimately be much more expensive than being vaccinated. So something I'm reading a lot just in sort of conjecture about how this is going is that it's much more advantageous for a third party payer to pay for a vaccination versus testing. So that's not like to say that anything is changing right this second, but that's a feeling in terms of medical communities. Uh, I, would, I would add one thing very quickly that uh, um, uh, this stuff is all very new, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but uh, typically, there are state by state rules related to uh, mandating employers pay for mandatory testing. If an employer is mandating a test, the employer typically is responsible to pay. Mm -hmm. Now, I have not yet seen a case on it. Um, I have not seen uh, any discussion about it. Uh, there have been a lot of lawsuits related to insurance refusing to cover uh, certain aspects of the COVID issue. Um, <laughs> we couldn't get coverage, uh, John, as you know, uh, for uh, under our malpractice uh, uh, provider. They refused to cover us for dealing with COVID issues. Mm -hmm. and, and why is that? Because it's too new. They don't know uh, enough about it and they know, don't know how to underwrite it. And they don't know whether they, you know, you know, insurance, if, if, if they don't know how to underwrite it and they don't know much about it, they don't cover it. Okay. But at the same time, employers need to be careful because uh, an employee may bring them before what's called in uh, Illinois, the wages uh, board and, and uh, uh, argue that they should have paid for the cost. That's great information. And, and thank you to both of you. We're out of time. Dr. Chris, Bill Judge, thank you for your brains and your insights and the time that you spend researching these topics. I'm sure it was very, very helpful for the attendees. As a reminder, uh, and I guess my halo light going out, <laughs> not a reminder that it's time to go. It's like pulling the curtain. Uh, we, we have information for you. We have a you know the white paper that we'll be providing to you if you reach out to us, info at arcpointlabs.com. We'll get that white paper out to you that, that goes into detail 
about how your peers are responding to this mandate. Uh, we also have local industry experts that can come out, have a conversation with you, and let you know the best practices, the best testing options, uh, the policies that you need, and the technology that's going to be a part of this process. Uh, let you know all the different options and, and whether or not that fits into what it is that you uh, that you need. So have a wonderful rest of the day. Once again, thanks for your attendance. Thanks for caring about your employees. And uh, we'll talk to you soon.